Thank you again for, for um, coming to the um, We All Send this afternoon. It's freezing outside, isn't it? Um, it's, what we're going to do is um, we're going to talk about um, a wonderful text um, in a moment, and we're going to do that for about half an hour. And then after that half hour, we will have about 15 minutes for you in the audience to ask questions. And it's always the most stimulating part of the afternoon to get people in the audience involved in the discussion. So, so please um, have something to add to the discussion. We would really welcome that. Um, and obviously, we're here today to look at Joppa Lahiri's first collection of short stories, Interpretive Melodies, a book for which she won the Pulitzer Prize in 2000. Um, she's gone on, of course, to write subsequent um, short story collection. Um, and the novel The Namesake, which was also very successfully made into a feature film. Um, this, her first book, um, really had an enormous impact on readers when it was, was released. And um, our guests and I were talking out the back about, for us, it's a great book to revisit because it's a book that I did read about 10 years ago. And to reread it again the last couple of weeks has just been a, a, a fantastic revisit to a, no, uh, a book which is even better than I thought it was the first time around. Um, our guest today is, a, is a, um, a remarkable Australian writer, Patty O'Reilly. Um, I know her work and don't have to Google her, but when I did, anyway, it says writing as P.A. O'Reilly. So that's <laughs> so you don't confuse her with Patty O'Reilly. Kind of okay. disguised. Yes. Um, she published her first novel in 2005, The Factory and a very successful um, short story collection, The End of the World, in 2007. I will note this, that amongst writers of short fiction, and I publish mostly short fiction, um, Patty O'Reilly would be, I think, along with Kate Kennedy, one of those writers in Australia that we revere, that other writers revere as a short story writer. Um, she is a writer's writer, but she's also a punter's writer, which is a, a, a remarkable thing to, to be. Um, her novel last year, The Fine Colour of Rust, I only picked up on Monday, um, and apparently um, it is a version at 17.99 or 95. That's right. Um, so it's the version of the novel that was actually released last year, and you can get it now at a remarkably good price. You get two for that. Okay, so Patty's our guest today, um, and she's very passionate about um, short fiction, so I think we'll have a great session. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, Patty, one thing I don't normally do, um, we're given um, study notes to look at um, each week for this event, and we don't look at them too closely because we're here to have a conversation about a book as, as readers and writers. But one of the things that struck me is a couple of things that were suggested in the study notes that sort of bristled with me a little bit or that I'd like to get your opinion on, sort of a general opinion before we go into specifics. And one of the um, comments is that Lahiri's stories aren't about being Indian but about being human. Now, to me, I suppose the obvious answer would be, well, it's both. But to you, to you and the extent of thinking about the writer, thinking about the material, how much do you think about it as the, the Indian culture being um, portrayed in the book and how much it is it about a universal culture being portrayed in the book? Well, I think you're exactly right. It's about both, of course. But uh, <clears throat> to me, it's, it's actually about less... It's not about one or the other. It's about movement. This whole book is about movement and, and developing identities from one form to another and talking about... Obviously, you talk, she's talking about the diaspora, mm -hmm. but she does have those two stories that are set in India, which very interestingly uh, are different in more ways than one to the rest of the stories, I think. Mm -hmm. And the two stories that are sent in India, what I found amazing about those two was that unlike the rest of the stories, the two stories set in India don't have a very close point of view, mm -hmm. a single point of view. So the rest of the stories are either first person point of view or a very close third person point of view. And these ones are, are much more... Well, one of them is actually in, in uh, first-person plural, we, which is a really unusual point of view. And the other one is talking about 
uh, talking about um, Burima mm -hmm. from the point of the community. Mm -hmm. So they're actually much more distanced from the the uh, main character, the protagonist of the story. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, that is a really interesting look at India and the Indian form of community in two almost opposite ways. Yeah. Because in one, the community is actually rejecting Burima, and in the other one, the community supports Bibi Helder yeah. when... Uh, when everything else around her collapses and when her family deserts her. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to family being so huge and, and being a really important part of Indian culture in, in every other story, in this single story, it's the family that falls away and the community that steps up. Yeah. Now, the other um, provocation in the, in the text for discussion, and I'm sure this one is deliberately to provoke a response which might be a bit different, is that um, the statement's made that we can never broach the space between two cultures. Now, yeah, that's a respond? provocation, isn't it? Well, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so too. Otherwise, otherwise, we'll all just have to stay in our houses, frankly, and never go out. How do you think the, the stories do try to broach the gap between cultures or, or possibly the, the abrasiveness between cultures? Yeah, I, it's it's. Uh, I don't think her, I don't think the writer's role is actually to solve anything, mm -hmm. and so I think the writer's role is actually to ask questions, mm -hmm. and that's what she does the best. And so what she's asking is, how do you do this? How do you acculturate to a to a new country? How do you? Lift, take up your life and move it somewhere else. How do you find your identity in a new place? And and that was the other thing that struck me too, that she's, she's not just talking about identity in terms of India in America or India, London, whatever, or uh, one part of India and another, or Muslim and Hindu. Mm -hmm. She's also, in this book, which is so so very much, except, again, for those two stories set in India, nearly every story is about marriage. And so it's, a, it's also, it's, it's that process of identity. Mm -hmm. So the process of identity that she's, she's talking about in this book is moving culturally, and it's moving also from being a single person into a marriage and the process of, of your identity changing as you become a partner in that marriage. Yeah, look, I, and I really, lo I really love that, what you started with there, that, it, well, not, well, not only is it not the writer's role, it's not a, the need for a story to show a success or failure. What she does exactly. is, and what the stories indicated are complexities. Yep. So that it's not for us to make a conclusion in that sense about success or failure, but to reflect on the complexities of these people's lives, which I think is just done in a way that is so affecting. Again, to go back and read the stories a second time, I suppose part of that is being having both of me familiarity with the stories, but also discovering something new in the stories. Did you find that on your second reading, that the, there's those layers that you often find with good fiction? Absolutely. I found a, a, a real richness there again. And so the first time, I think the first time you read them, for, well, for me, the first time I read them, the, the Indian cultural, uh, the food and the, the cultural mores and everything were, were deeply fascinating and how people moved with them and against them in, in the way that they worked into their world. But on the second reading, it really came down to that person, the, the layers of personal challenge became much more obvious and, and yeah, very layered, very rich and also the complexity, I think, too, of of working with, of, of learning to live with one person, with two people, with a whole community. So it, I think she explores each of those in every mm -hmm. story, that it's not just how do you move into another country, it's mm -hmm. how do you move into meeting another person, how do you move into having children, how do you move into another country with different cultural expectations. The, the, can I now talk, I want to talk about a couple of um, 
characters or relationships in these stories. And um, for me, um, reading, I was I was really touched by the relationship between Mrs. Sen and the, the small boy <laughs> Elliot. And it's very subtle, very beautifully dealt with, but it's so affecting. And again, some of the commentary on Mrs. Sen as a character is, is couched in the negative in the sense of her failure to assimilate or an inability to, to be part of this sort of American modernity. Um, so I particularly enjoyed that relationship between her and the boy. And it, although she doesn't, in some senses, have a secure sense of place in a new country, that's, that's quite obvious. And she doesn't have status. So, I mean, her status is clearly as, as marginalised in some senses. What I thought was so remarkable was that she provided that boy with a deeply emotional relationship. There was a real human connection between them. And it showed for me, again, in the writer and the story, that here is someone who we may see on the margins, but in fact, in this story, that interaction with Mrs. Sen and Elliot, it senses them. And uh, every, everything else is on the periphery. Even though she, uh, she smashes the car up, she gets on the, on the bus with a bloody bag of fish, that intimate relationship between her and the boy is, is, is really, it is a, that is about the human condition and that was remarkably dealt with, with great subtlety. I thought so too and I thought that they, the way that she confided in him gave him a new level of confidence in being, being not just someone who was being babysat but in giving himself a level of confidence in again interpreting what was happening to her so that you know, they both grew in yeah. that relationship. Yeah. It was very beautiful. And that reading of it, which, which talks, and again, I'm, you know, we, we're getting stuck into the crib notes, but about her, it's about her failure to assimilate. It, to me, it, ju it just doesn't give enough credibility to her spiritual and emotional presence. It's such an anchor in the story, I felt. Yes, and also I think probably what's just as good to look at is, is the depth of her longing and yearning mm. and how the boy how Elliot sees that and, and recognises that you know there's such a deep love she's holding for her family and mm. her country that he has probably never seen before. Yeah and in that I think what you can see in the boy is clearly having quite strong material security but he has this emotional awakening through her, her directness. Exactly. I mean, I love that as well, the way that they were equals. Yes. There's something quite equal about them. Yes. So even though she was his carer, they were at, a, at an equal level. I think you sometimes see that too in, in grandparent, grandchild relationships when the yeah. children reach their teens and it becomes, that, it becomes a much more equal relationship than a child can ever have with their parent. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that is... Grandparents are a great buffer in that way. Absolutely. Um, now, we will, um, I think, now get on to the difficult issue of sex and infidelity because it is clear in a couple of stories. And I want to ask you your, your response to the outcome. So th there's two stories here, and, and particularly a temporary matter, which is the opening story of the couple who yeah, don't have electricity and we know that it brings them back together after this terrible circumstances they've gone through and we, we know the outcome. And the other story is, is sexy. But I'm interested in the way that intimacy is dealt with in these stories, and I, I'd love to get a response to, to a temporary matter. So um, we get this situation where the couple, um, Shobar and Shukumo, 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 yeah, where, where they have this conversation where they're gradually revealing um, secrets to each other, and she reveals that you know after they've had made love, they, he feels that they're much closer than they have been for some time. She then reveals that she is leaving, and it's then that he reveals the terrible reality of that he had in fact seen their um, stillborn child. He it was a boy, and he knows that, and he tells her that. I want to read the last paragraph and, and speculate a response from you. Sukuma stood up and shackled his plate on top of hers. He carried the plates to the sink, but instead of running the tap, he looked out the window. Outside the evening was still warm, and the Bradfords were walking arm in arm. As he watched the couple, the room went dark and he spun around. Sherba had turned the lights out. 
She came back to the table and sat down. After a moment, Sukuma joined her. They wept together for the things they now knew. Now, do you think that when he reveals this secret, is it a vindictive act? Or what is motivating him revealing this secret to her? That is a huge question. That's a huge... I, I pondered that when I read it again. The first time I read it, I remember way back that immediately I thought that was, that was vindictive mm. and it was his... <clears throat> it was revenge for her leaving him. But this time, on, a, on this reading, I actually felt that it was a, a spontaneous... Uh, result of him having carried that secret for so long that he had no choice but to let it go mm. because he was letting that go just as he was also coming to realise that he didn't love her anymore yeah. just as she didn't love him so it was a rather than an act of revenge that it was a letting go uh, the other thing I thought and again I, I, it's relative to your point I think that when um a, a tragedy might stop, strike a couple or a family and often it is possibly the tragedy of loss of, of, of a child or a loved one and there is an inability or refusal to speak about it before people can move on whether together or separately it has to be spoken something has to be said and that last sentence interests me because that they now had to understand what they knew shared together yeah. so regardless of whether they were going to move on or not revealing that was in fact for the better rather than it simply be to get back at her for having realised that she, she was leaving him. So it seems that you know, knowing was important mm, regardless that, of what was going to happen. That's true and that the result no matter whether I mean clearly in this story that is the end of it, that's the end of the marriage mm. but that's not necessarily a bad result. No mm. and by the way I did read shackle the plates, he didn't shackle them, he just stacked them I mean, you, you don't need to shackle two plates to anything, I think, unless the dinner's really bad. OK. Um, <laughs> but since we're talking about those two stories, yeah. I would like to talk about sexy, which I think I is... I want to talk about sexy yeah. as well. So my only comment on sexy is that um, Miranda, um, when she has that conversation again with a child, this mm. is great, with Rowan, um, you know, what does sexy mean? I wondered throughout that whole story, because she's also getting this other story in her ear about an unfaithful husband leaving his wife across the other side of the world. One of the things that always strikes me is that, not from personal experience, by the way, the people who are in denial around these things usually know. There's something in them they do know, but they don't want to ask the question. And it's better to live in delusion for what value it gives you. Yeah, yeah these are guys obviously handsome, and she's enjoying the, the time they spend together. And my sense was that inherently she would know that this has got a limited shelf life. Mm. But it's almost that rather than her, when, I don't see the child, of course, as wiser than her, it's almost she needs someone to speak the obvious to her in a way that just, okay, again, it's like as if it's been said. So I actually see something strangely similar to, to the story we just mentioned is that something has to be spoken for someone to move on and in this case it's spoken through a precocious young boy. But That's interesting. I hadn't thought do, of do that. Do you see her as naive or? No, actually uh, that is a really interesting point though that, that that point of crisis is brought about by saying the unsayable again. Mm. But what I found fascinating about that one was was that you know that whole idea of Orientalism and that and that the East people of the East are exotic and they and it's a whole thing that's female and passive and beautiful and and here it seems to me that she's actually turned that around completely and Miranda the Western woman is passive mm -hmm. is exotic and is 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 completely controlled by Dev mm -hmm. and then. To make it even more so, this young boy, again, of, of the, who is Indian, has also has complete control of her. She is completely passive. And it mm -hmm. even talks at one point about how... Uh, is it Lakshmi is talking about her friend and how she shouldn't just be waiting around. Yeah. And then the next sentence is that 
Miranda is, is in fact, all she can do is wait. Yeah. She, all she does is wait. And so it's a complete turnaround of the whole Orientalist thing yeah. where Miranda is that passive, exotic, sexual um, thing to be exploited. And I don't think in the end she knows that. So you think she doesn't know it? I think, I think, she, I think, well, I think she doesn't think of it as being exploited. I mean, people might want to ask that in, in, in question time or, or take... I've got, I, I sort of think, well, to what extent she knows it, and this is certainly, you know, there's no tug of war over this. I, my sense was that it's got to be there at least in the subconscious. And when the, she has a conversation with the boy, it's sort of, it's forced to the forefront. But, but there's still a kind of acceptance of it, isn't there, in her? Oh, yeah. So you she might know it, it still, but she yeah. still accepts it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, yeah. It's easy to be deluded when you're making love to a handsome man or a good-looking woman, I suppose. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm sure. But anyway, Speaking like, from experience. Um, <laughs> um, OK. I want to ask you about another, uh, another two stories that I've sort of I've coupled together. And one is the um, interpretive of Melody, it's the title story, and the, the real Der one, which you've already mentioned. And I'm interested in the position of, um, in the case of um, interpretive melodies, Mr. Cap Capassi, the interpreter of the story. And of course, you've already mentioned um, Buri Ma in, in um, a, a real Der one. Now, I wonder. They were both characters who I had great sympathy for and great empathy. So I, I was barracking for them and was really, I suppose as a reader, as a punter, I was really unsatisfied, was, yeah, dissatisfied with the way they were treated by, by other characters. Because it seems that for Mr. Capacity, the interpreter, he, he's strangely in some, he becomes the outsider, although it's in India and you have this tourist family of, yeah, well not expats, but certainly their parents being born in India, but ethnic um, Indians. Um, in, in his case, I wondered, so you have this woman, Mrs. Dust, who confides in infidelity to him. She also confides that the son that she has is not her husband's son, which is a remarkable thing to tell a complete stranger. Now, what I wondered, she, conf she does confide him because he doesn't matter rather than he does matter. It seems to me that it's almost like an indulgence for her to confide in this man because it doesn't really have any consequences for her. If it had real consequences of judgment, of the possibility of him speaking, it would be a much different matter. So I felt that he was a, a character for her who didn't really, for the woman, who didn't have a lot of value. And in Buri Ma's case is that while she people seem to tolerate or even get humour out of the fact that she has this story of being from a high class and she's fallen on hard times. They seem amused by that, or they, yeah, they take amusement in her. And then, of course, when their apartments are robbed, they kick her out and, and throw her into the street. And so I'm not, with both of those characters, um, Lahiri seems to me to be um, showing us how people can be disregarded in a way that, that, in a sense, they're not disposable characters, but they're disposable as people in these situations. Yeah, they are in, in these two situations. I think you're right. And the way that Mr Capassi is treated by Mrs Stas is, is uh, as you say, she tells him this thing. He, he can judge her as much as he likes, but it's going to have absolutely no effect on her. Mm. And she's, she, of course she's confident that he'll never, he won't tell her husband because he has no power as yeah. the guide in that yeah. relationship. Yeah. He's, he's the person sitting in the front of the car, separated. So, yeah, but I, there are some people who would probably say the whole book's about outsiders and, yeah. and how, how people try to get to the inside of yeah. societies and communities, and, and those are the clearest ones where they've actually failed to do that. Uh, what about, I mean, I just want to probe that a bit further with, with, with this relationship, because one of the things that I felt, again, with the two stories we've already mentioned, is to speak the secret or to speak the unspeakable was to do something quite powerful. But it seems in, in Mrs Dust's case, to speak about her infidelity and this child to, to this man is the opposite. It's because it doesn't have consequences. It does seem to be a throwaway thing, doesn't yeah. it? It's like she, she, she can entertain her sort of gossip and infidelity with him rather than anything profound. Mm. And do you think 
Do you think that that actually lifts the feeling of... She says she's been in pain all this time, although you, you really don't get the sense that she has in any way. It's, it does feel like words, doesn't it? Yeah. It feels just like words that she's saying, I've been in pain all this time, and yet there's no actual evidence of it from the way that any, no. anything else about her. And so, yeah, is it... Does she actually leave anything behind with it? Well, see, it's interesting because I, I would, my thoughts were no. He seemed to me, I felt, yeah, he obviously had an unfulfilled sense of himself and his life. Emotionally, he was, I think, a much more, a much deeper character. And for me, there was, there's a sadness in him as a character because he had these dreams and even fantasies about, you know, he could possibly have future correspondence with her. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see that as, yeah, there's nothing path pathetic about that. It's something about that was, I found quite moving. And Absolutely. she obviously didn't, she didn't connect with that at all. No, no, because she was still treating him as a servant. Yeah. So if you, if you tell your secret to a servant, then it goes no further, does it? Yeah. That's part of their job to keep that. Now, I'll ask one more question and then we're going to have our um, discussion because we started a few minutes late. Um, I said well, at the back, we weren't going to talk about each other as writers, but as a writer and thinking about craft, I think there were, you know, when I do just momentarily and I'm ready to put my writer's hat on, there were just moments in this book I just was knocked away by. I thought, I love... Now, the, I think one of them is, is the devastating revelation at the end of um, the first story with the, with the couple about the child. But again, in this, in this story with Burima, when there's that moment when she occasionally, he says it almost dismissively, that she's invited into their apartments, and then says she's very careful not to sit on the furniture. Yes. I mean, it's, it's one a, sentence. Mm, very but powerful. it's devastating. Mm. Um, I mean, I, it's that thing where I think a great writer with the greatest economy, with no um, explanation, just in that one sentence, it's, it's just heartbreaking, but also it's, it's, it reflects a reality because there's no emotive dressing up of that. It's almost, this is, um, how did you respond to it as a writer I know it's hard to differentiate, but thinking about writing, yeah. were there moments in it for you where you think, wow, well, that's the sort well, of... Well, that particular one, I think, that particular moment where you, you read that she, she is careful not to sit on the furniture, is that many, many short stories have a moment, I think, where they turn mm -hmm. and where you, you, you've been thinking all along, well, they've been treating her this way, they, they laugh at her stories about how wealthy she was and so on, but there's a certain affection about it, it seemed to me. And then there's a point and the writer puts in a line and suddenly everything turns. Yes. And that for me was that moment when everything turned and you realised that in fact she, she's a little bit despised. Yeah. And I don't think they'd have been in the, there in the story and, yeah. and it was, oh, it was chilling. It was quite and, chilling. And that's interesting because that moment, then when you get to the ending and you f she's cast out, mm -hmm. that one moment, those two, it links it as, yeah, the... Of yep. course this is what would happen. Yep. Yep. Whereas if you didn't have that moment, you might think, why have they suddenly turned on her? Whereas mm. they haven't suddenly turned on her. She's always been in her place and that's what, yeah. It's interesting you say that because and this, and this might sound weird, it's uh, when I read the story, I was thinking at home, it's the difference between when I, you know, people who like their pets to sit on the furniture and those that don't. My Stavichia Terrier gets into bed with me every morning, so <laughs> it's a very different situation. Yeah. Okay. Um, We've got about 15 minutes, and as I said at the outset, we would really like to have your input into the discussion. Um, we did, we do have a bit of a slight different opinion on, on possibly one aspect of the, the book as to why something was revealed, but we were happy to take questions or comments from anywhere in the room. So um, we've got two roving mics, so who would like to, who would like to start? Can I just talk about another thing while you're thinking about your questions? Uh, another turning point in that last story where uh, he's there with the old lady yeah. and where he, he suddenly realises that the correct thing to say is splendid. Mm. <laughs> that was a beautiful moment and, mm. you, and you feel like, okay, these two worlds have come together. Yeah. These two worlds, these two people who, who have come 
out of worlds that no longer exist for them. And they've come together in this single word, splendid. It's just a, it's just a beautiful turning mm. moment. It is. Mm. So who would like to ask the first question, please? Do you write down the back? Hello. Um, sorry, I might have. I came in a little bit late, so I'm not sure if you touched this on this already. But I was wondering if you believed that there was a significance in um, who actually told the story and whether that you probably did talk about it. Yeah, but it's probably worth talking about again, isn't it? Um, we didn't talk about it in great detail. It's Just, a very good question. So yeah. I'm going to let Patty talk about it. <laughs> Thanks for that, Tony. Uh, I, what I did say was, it's very interesting. The two stories that seem to me. Uh, to be very different from the others because they don't have either a first person narrator or a close third person narrator. And those stories are the one about Buri Ma and about Bibi Haldar. And they're the only two set in India. And so that I think it's really worth thinking about that, that why is it, why is it that uh, the two stories that in fact have a wider point of view are the ones set in India. Mm -hmm. And the, the second one, which is in first person plural, the Bibi Haldar one, the treatment of Bibi Haldar, is, is uh, I find it a beautiful story in that, in that these, they come together to, to take over from the lack of family and the failure of everyone to treat or help Bibi Haldar. But writing in, th in first person plural, we, we do this, we do that, is a really interesting thing. Is she saying that they're just working as a community? Or I have read a couple of stories, not from this, but other stories where the we was actually meaning to indicate all care and no responsibility. Whereas this one, to me, seems to be the opposite. They are actually taking responsibility for her in place of her family. But the other stories... I, I didn't go through them that closely in terms of point of view, but it seems to me that they are either first person or very close third person point of view where you only see what happens from the point of view of that, the person who's, who's the main character in the story. That is, I mean, that's important to the, the question of, of even with third person, it's quite intimate working very closely, whereas often one of the advantages or the one of perceived advantages of um, third person point of view is to give that sort of wide angle to move in and out, but they are quite That's intimate right. in that sense. The Buri Ma one is in third person, but it, it does pop into the heads of other people, so yeah. which, it, which doesn't happen so much in, other, in the other stories. No. We've got one down, right down the front, and were you about to put your hand up? I might see how it goes. Might see how it goes. Oh, it's going to go well. Don't worry about that. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was such an interesting talk. But um, I wanted to just ask you a little bit about Interpreter of Maladies. Um, that's another story set in India. And um, that's true. it's not really a... It's just a third-person narrator, I think. I don't think it's particularly close. It's certainly not a we, a plural. No, but it, I, I do think it's quite close in Mr. Capassi's point of view, isn't it? Well, the one that I'm that I found so interesting in that story was Mrs. Das, mm -hmm. and I know she's mm -hmm. a character that people. The first time I read it, I read it years ago, ten years ago, say, and um, yeah, I remember just racing through it and thinking, yes, she really is, um, you know, a horrible person. But this second time that I read it, um, I didn't feel that. I, I actually felt enormous compassion for her. And, um, and one of the things was um, where it tells about her, she's recounting her experiences of you know, having this a child when she spoke to Mr. Capassi. But um, she told the story of, as a teenager, being stuck with the husband or put with the husband upstairs mm -hmm. which sounded awfully irresponsible of the parents I thought but um, and she said you've no idea what we got up to but then she sort of stopped and said well perhaps that was the intention that's what the parents wanted mm -hmm. and um, and then the next thing that you learn is that her friends 
with this relationship, her friends drifted off because she was the first married and um, had, you know, different responsibilities. And um, then she had the first child, I've forgotten, is it Raj, I think, is, I don't know anyway, the first child, whatever his name was. But um, I thought she might have been suffering from postnatal depression. Her parents have both gone back to India, so she's lost family, she's lost her friends, that's all told in the one paragraph. Mm. And, um, and then she's you know, got this little boy, her husband's out teaching at a university, her life sounds as if it's just very boring and monotonous. And, um, and then the husband invites a friend to come and stay, and it was such a, a kind gesture, but the friend completely abused. And when you were talking about, you know, f characters that are very passive, well, she was just the passive person. Well, that's right. And one interesting thing too, I think, is that Mr. Capassi talks about her and her husband as not being like parents, but being like siblings of their children. And so, I, that, and in that way, I think Lahiri has, has quite a lot of sympathy for her too. Even though her behaviour might be seen to be bad, she's actually giving you the opportunity to see that she, she's never been able to grow out of being a child because she was in essence a child bride and then she was taken advantage of and she now has these children that he sees her behaving with as though she is a sibling rather than a parent. It's interesting because you, you raise a really important issue which is if we could say for all of us um, specifically to the story, to this story, it's about one of the questions we could raise is that, and I think it's a wonderful um, response to the story, is to what, to what extent, and you said it's sort of disposed of in one paragraph, that information that is so vital to a psychological understanding. Well, one of the interesting questions as a reader and a writer is, Lahiri was such a, a, very, a, a great at her craft, why would she do that? And I think it would have to be purposeful. But the other thing you raised, and this is for all of us, and it's sort of by the by, but in the sense of, of it's remarkable when we go back to stories, and as you're saying, you'd read it years ago, um, I find that going back to really great stories is it's, it is incredible as much as you read them closely and deeply and you think you know them, of those revelations and shifts in your response over time. Um, one of my favourite all-time stories is Alistair MacLeod's story, The Boat, from his collection Island. I've taught the story many times, I've read the story many times, and each time I read it, I both discover something new, and a bit like you, I, I shift myself. So what I'm going to do in this case, I'm going to go back to the story and and hopefully find some more sympathy for it. But uh, it's a great point to raise. Yeah, but also I think I think you're right that there's kind of the writers plant these bombs, time bombs, yeah. inside their stories. Yeah. And it's only on a close reading that those bombs will explode for you. And so, you know, that, that sympathy for her I think will come on a second the first reading you're all with Mr. Capassi. The second reading you start seeing her and you know she's had no chance to become a woman she's stuck in this kind of yeah. adolescence okay um we're going to take two more because as i said we started a bit late but there's one down the back but we've still got one down the front here in the third row are you, are you so here first sorry yeah and then we, i think there was one down the back yes i, I think uh, my question is a bit on a theme because i thought it's really interesting what you said about the choice of narrator and the choice of perspective. And I was just wondering if you had an opinion about, with the first story, why they chose to tell it from that point of view, from the husband's point of view, rather than the wife's point of view. Because for most of the stories, to me, I could really, it made a lot of sense to me why they chose one person, not the other. But in that story, I found, I find it, not that I think it was the wrong choice, but quite, quite intriguing why she chose to make it from his point of view. That's an interesting one. Of course, I can't say why she chose it, but what it did for me, what it did for me reading it from his point of view was that that very last revelation where he, said, he tells her that he held their dead child and, it, and he tells her that it was a male is that it's a surprise to himself that he does it. And we could never have got that if it had been from her point of view. 
And the other thing relative point to the, the secrecy and surprise is that, and I'm not saying you couldn't do this technically or, or um, creatively, but it is interesting, it's a relative point that the fact that she is going to leave him, she knows as well. So what's interesting, and I think Patty's point here is it's great to think of them together, he doesn't realise what he's going to reveal until the moment where she always knows what she's going to reveal. She intends to leave him. So I think it's around the, t it's, well, it's around the, the, the structure of how those secrets are revealed through that sort of exercise they engage in. But it's, again, it's, a, it's, it's a, often, you know, Patty says, well, we don't know why she did it, but it's one of those things to, it's interesting to speculate on because it, it would shift the story, wouldn't it? It would be a very different story. It would okay, be we're, such we a are taking story. one more question down the back there. Oh, it, it, just a comment, really. Um, in the um, interpreter of Mallory's story, Mr. Capazzi notes that Mrs. Das has already fallen out of love with life, mm -hmm. and I think that's very telling in her, um, almost her toying with him, that she's got so little excitement in her life that she's had this fling, this affair, gave her a bit of colour and movement for a while, she's got this child. Now, over in India, she's got this chance to sort of confess to this man, um, briefly exciting, and then it's all sort of dissipated. Yeah. So I think we need to be a little bit, yeah. I certainly was uh, empathetic with, yeah. with Mrs. Das because she's 28, she's got the kids, she's got the husband, life looks as though it's going to be fairly uneventful for, you know, forever. Not it's true, it's true. She's trying to make something happen, isn't she? Mm. She's trying to make something happen, trying to shift something, but she fails. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not a unique experience. Mm. Um, look, can I just say in closing, just particularly um, on these questions, it's been a great session for me and I suspect for Patty Very because what we've shown here is, or what you've shown us that in your great reader responses, we've learned a lot mm. more about one story in particular. And I, I think, again, it indicates the, the, the depth of understanding and engagement with this book that people have such engaging, intelligent responses for us to, to con contemplate when we go back to the, the book, which we will. Mm. Um, and as we usually do, um, we really um, hope you enjoyed the session. And um, for students here who could have asked a couple more questions, we do hope you have a, a great VCE year and a very successful year. And please look out for future events at the Wheeler Centre for VCE students. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you.